Choices by Susan Kerslake Part 2 of 2 She must stay in control. She must get on top of it. Close attention to minute adjustments, uprisings, migrations. She tried to analyze the chain. Burning, sharp, dull, a pressure. Was there a center to it? How far out did it radiate? How long did it last? It took so much energy, she wasn't sure she could keep it up. So much concentration. To surrender would be, could be imagined. Giving in to the flood of pain, drowning in it, brain-breaking pain. I think I heard something. Strangers were out there, still out there. They hadn't gone away. She made more sounds, full of the pain. Can you talk? Are you awake? Don't move. There's been an accident. Thank God, giving her information, something to keep her sane. You're wedged in the car. The engine has come up into the front of the car. We're trying to figure out how to get you out. She heard creaking, the jiggling of metal. They were starting to touch the car. Don't, she groaned. Something might move or fall, set off sparks or explosions. Don't. Nausea rolled, roiled up in her throat. They must be careful of her. They couldn't make a mistake. What did they know about the situation? What could they see? She heard more voices. One was louder, giving orders. Move on. There's nothing to see here, folks. Just keep moving. It sounded like a TV program. The boss was here. A picture flashed in her mind of the highway. Placid, empty, solid cement squirted out of a tube, lying between the gravel and grass, the sky lapping, dipping in a tongue. A blue tongue. Too much was going on. She was too tired for all this information. Only one thing mattered. Pain. If they could get her out and straighten her out, the pain would stop. It would just run out the bottoms of her feet, the top of her head. Stream out her fingers. She was too full. There was no more room. Why didn't they just do it? Stop talking at her, explaining what wasn't happening. Just do it. Don't talk. It shouldn't be up to her to have to figure this out, to argue and make the plans. She had too much to do with her own body. She felt sorry for it. Poor, helpless, trapped thing. Punished. Something was dripping on the side of her face, scalding her ear and neck. She was going to have to let go. For a while, she had been able to browse and form a knowledge of this territory. She could not tolerate change. The stuff dripped more slowly if it would only stop in time before she lost control. When she woke and smelt the air, there was a definite change, an ant antiseptic odor. Am I already saved, she thought? Was it true? A hive of voices answered her thoughts. Thank God she's alive! What did that mean? Of course she was alive. There was even a moment when she was free of the pain. Look, we've got to see if that engine is loose, if it can be lifted. The voices were tense. She found herself listening analytically, thinking about the plan. Would it work? Things were happening very fast. There was a lot of motion just outside. It made the air move. She felt calm and trusting. Even if they killed her, she wouldn't blame them. Accidents piled on accidents. Skinned knees, stubbed toes, cuts. Each time she delivered herself to someone to fix it to make things right, each time they had. Once started, it went very quickly. The motor began to move. In several places, the pipes were bonded to her skin. When it pulled up, it tore off the flesh. Sections came apart, spilling more gas and oil on her. Pain blossomed when pressure was released and blood flowed through pinched veins. At one point, she slumped helplessly to the side. Then, for the first time, she felt human hands. Someone was there to catch her. Her head fell into a bowl of hands. Many hands reached her. She thought they were making that terrible grinding noise, but then she saw the motor being lifted away. They had to hold her until a board could be slipped under to t slide her out. When the men saw her move on her own, they put her on a stretcher. The sun struck her face. An enormous space dotted with faces opened above her head. 
but she didn't mind. Balloons, a party. She tried to smile for all the lovely faces around her. Close to her ear, paper wrappers were being torn. Materials were laid on her for a table. They began to cut away her clothes with scissors, lifting the cloth, pulling it away from her skin. She watched the faces, the cringe of lips, narrowing of eyes. When they walked around, their shoes crunched the gravel. I'm going to start an IV. I'm going to wash your mouth. I'm going to give you some oxygen, your gulping air. The mask was clear plastic. She didn't want it on her face. She didn't want anything touching her face. The sun was right overhead, shining, hot, pushing her eyelids down, settling into the hollows on each side of her collarbones. There were no images on the insides of her eyelids, just colors, nothing frightening. But she was frightened. Where was Ken? He should be there somewhere. These were nice people, but they were strangers. Then, in the ambulance, he was suddenly there, sitting across from her feet. She could see him. How peculiar to see him scrunched among the medical supplies, tubes, packets. He was far away, blurred. She could smell urine. She thought about when she used to be able to move her arms. One was strapped down with the IV, but that was just for now. Even the light in the ambulance hurt her eyes. The pupils wouldn't contract. She didn't want to have to close her eyes again, ever again. Something made a lot of noise. The sound was in her head, the crush and thud of metal and rubber. rubber. Now she knew just what it was. Ken was bent between his arms and legs. She knew he didn't hear it. Calmly, she noticed that he was bald. No, what was that? A bandage on his head. He'd hit his head. Was that all? A bump on the head? She looked around. Did they know that? A bump on the head. The attendant was gazing out the frosted window. Periodically, he glanced at the intersection in the IV. Flat on her back, it was hard to breathe. Her lungs were sliding up into her throat. Reaching across her body to adjust the oxygen, the attendant jolted her legs. She saw it, no doubt, no confusion, but she didn't feel him. Not a touch, a bump, nothing. The breath jumped in her throat. Up in the corner was a round metal surface. Something was showing. An image was captured inside. She tried to catch Ken's eye to get him to look, but he wouldn't. His lips were wrinkled as if he'd seen something distasteful. She looked at the mirror-like thing again. It drew her eyes. Ken! Ken! But it was a mumble, and when she found him, he was putting his hands on each side of his head, leaning forward, He looked like he was thinking. What was it? Didn't he have anything more to say? About staying with her? About his responsibilities? A hollow place began to open in her chest. Cold sank in. He could get up and walk away. What if he did? He was the one who'd been through this with her. Whose idea had it been anyway? Who called whom? Out of the space in her chest came the feeling that it wouldn't be enough that she would be disappointed. The fact that there had been a choice, that this was the matter of a choice, struck her. If she'd had to go, a line of duty, emergency, but this, for no reason.